Okay, so this talk is about controlling the world, using your software to make things, physical things happen in the world, such as uh, turning on and off lights, fans, motors, radio transmitters, um, batteries, things like that. Oh, and a special bonus, ha uh, powering your computer from the world, which I forgot to make any slides for. And definitely stop me and ask questions at any time. So, this is an Arduino, this is a computer, but it's a very small computer in the sense that it's uh, got less resources than even some of the earliest personal desktop computers. And uh, the programs that you run on this thing are a lot simpler than the kinds of things that we've been learning about at CyberWizard. And there's no keyboard or screen. And it doesn't, uh, you know, a adding internet connectivity is kind of a big deal. But the reason that I'm going to talk about this at first is because it has the advantage of having 5 volt inputs and outputs, and it's ubiquitous. They're really easy and cheap to get and play with, and they're uh, popular, a good learning point. I'm going to, um, after I cover some basics, I'm going to mention the more um, Linux familiar computing platforms like BeagleBone Black and Raspberry Pi and how they are pretty similar to the Arduino in terms of inputs and outputs, but there's also some important differences that make them a little less easy to interface to the physical world, like I'm going to show you. So this, and this is the schematic for the Arduino that we were just looking at. And uh, what you see is on your, on your left, you'll see um, the box represents a chip, which is the USB interface. And that's because the, micro, the, the Arduino computer, which is the big box on the right, doesn't have a USB interface because um, that's kind of a specific thing. But the Arduino is intended to be programmed by, for example, your laptop. And they included the USB in order to make it so you didn't need anything else. That USB also allows you to communicate with it. So, um, the first and, and most direct way for you to interface the software from, for example, your laptop or an old laptop that you're using for a specific, um, you know, Internet of Things or whatever it is that you want to do, is that you can plug it into an Arduino and use the Arduino to make the, electri the electrical connections to the world in the way that I'm going to show you and use the computer in real time to tell the Arduino, okay, turn number three on, turn number five off, and you can communicate through the USB to do that. And the Arduino becomes basically a hardware extension of your laptop, which has great resources, hard drive, internet, all that stuff. So it's, it, you don't have to use it by itself. You can just use it as kind of uh, a way, because your laptop doesn't have any general purpose I.O. pins that you can just wire up to relays and stuff. They don't do that anymore. These are transistors, and many of them are pretty old. Uh, but the basic idea is that, you know, I thought these are kind of an intimidating electronic component because when you look at something, you might know what a resistor or a capacitor is, but when you see these things, they've got a lot of numbers all over them and there's a lot of different kinds. And some of them that look like this are actually not transistors. They're integrated circuits and they have a whole city inside with logic and all kinds of decision making. But we're just going to talk about transistors and mostly the kind that you see on the right. Um, and uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of different kinds of transistors, but in this talk, I'm just going to focus on, um, on FETs, field effect transistors, because they are the mo they're the simplest kind of transistor to directly connect to the output pins of a, of a, tra of a uh, microcontroller, like an Arduino, for example. Uh, you just hook them up. It's, re it's really straightforward. And um, in MOSFETs, there's two styles two polarities. There's N-channel, you see on the left, and P-channel that you see on the right. And because schematics are generally drawn with, um, with the positive, like the plus 12 volts or whatever, toward the top, and the ground or the zero volts reference at the bottom, uh, they usually draw a P-channel transistor on the right upside down because the source in a P-channel transistor is always more positive than the drain. Uh, but you'll see more of that later. Anyway, I'm not planning to talk about the P-channel transistor because it's, uh, it's enough to just cover N-channel, which is the simplest one to connect to a microcontroller because um, controlling a transistor like this is a matter of 
controlling the, the relative voltage between gate and source. And in an n-channel transistor, you can connect the source to the ground of your microcontroller and the gate to the, in, to the output pin of your microcontroller. And then the drain is the part that controls the motor or the light bulb or whatever it is that you want to turn on and off. And it doesn't get much simpler than that. So this is a diagram of an Arduino connected with an n-channel uh, MOSFET to a load, which um, that could be a motor or a solenoid, it doesn't matter. The point is that you can see that it's connected. There, there's a power supply, which is like a, let's say a 60 volt power supply or whatever voltage you have, 12 volt car battery. It's not the same voltage that the Arduino runs on. That's a separate issue. Uh, but the idea is that that motor, let's say it's a 60 volt motor, and that transistor, you can see that it's connected between the motor and the, the, the ground. Like the plus and minus coming out on the left, that's the power source. And you know that if the, if the red wire went to the motor and the black wire below it went directly to the motor, the motor would just run. But instead of connecting it directly, the black wire goes to the S, the source of the MOSFET, and then the D of the MOSFET goes to the motor, and the, the MOSFET gets to decide whether D and S are connected together or they're not connected together, just like a light switch. And then the G, the gate of the MOSFET, is connected to a pin of the Arduino. So the Arduino tells the MOSFET whether to be on or off, telling it whether or not to turn the motor on or off. The reason you need the transistor is because the electronics in the Arduino are nowhere near powerful enough or, or current carrying enough to switch like a big motor on and off, you know, like a, like a motor that could drive a car around or something, you know, a small car or whatever. The transistor will do that, and it'll do it with very little provocation from the microcontroller through the gate. So the transistor does that amplification, which I'll talk about later if we have time, the idea of amplification. And you'll notice a resistor there, which may be a little bit intimidating or confusing, or why is that there? What happens if I don't put it on there? The answer is that that resistor means that if, for whatever reason, the Arduino is not exerting any influence over its output pin 3, then the resistor will be the um, most influential element of that part of the circuit, and it will pull that green wire toward the black wire or ground. And that means that if the Arduino is disconnected, or if the Arduino is rebooting, or you're programming it or something, and pin 3 is not being asserted as an output, then the transistor will default to being off because of that resistor. Um, another thing I should mention is that in your programming of a microcontroller, you have to tell it that you want pins to be outputs. Because by default, when a, pr when a microcontroller starts up and you haven't told it, then uh, any of those general purpose IOs or GPIO pins default to an input. And that means that if you connect them to some other circuit, they're not exerting any influence over that circuit. They're not pulling the voltage up or down. They're just ready to read the, the state of that pin into the software if asked. So your program has to start with the explicit instruction of make pin 3 an output. And then separately you'll be saying make pin 3 high or make pin 3 low. This is a diagram of what we were just looking at. That's the way that they typically draw an n-channel transistor. The gate is on the left and that's the part that tells the transistor whether or not you want it to connect drain and source together like a switch. And when the gate is, let's say, 5 volts above the ground, which is at the bottom, then the transistor is on, and D and S are connected together as if you put a butter knife or a wire connecting between them. And when you do that, you can see that the M, or the motor, is connected from 12 volts to 0 volts through the transistor. You can, um, on a microcontroller, even like an Arduino, which has a relatively small number of GPIO pins, you can have multiple things connected. So this is a diagram for that uh, kind of LED strip, not the intelligent LEDs, which is a different talk, but the kind where there's, they can light up red or green or blue or any color in between. The whole strip is the same color at the same time, but it can be any color you want. And the way that you do that is you connect 
a transistor for each of the three colors. And uh, in this case, they used the black wire of the LED strip as the plus, because red is for the red LEDs. And the reason that they connect the three pluses together of the LEDs is because n-channel transistors turn the minus side of whatever it is on and off by connecting it to minus or not. So you connect the plus of your power source, which is at the top, to the LEDs, to all of them, and the transistors control the minus of each of the three LEDs. And uh, I'll also mention that in this application, if you want to control the brightness of the LEDs, which of course you want to, you don't want to just have what's uh, three bits. That would be eight different colors. You could have black or white or uh, six other colors in between. You want to actually be able to have like a million colors or something. The way that you do that is you can vary the brightness of each of the colors independently, and that's why in this diagram you can see that they've plugged in the control. The pins that they're controlling there are PWM pins. Those are pins that in the microcontroller, they're internally wired up to the timer subprocessor of the CPU, which allows you to, instead of having a software loop do this, you can just program that subprocessor to, for example, turn that pin on and off with a certain percentage of the time it's on and a certain percent off. And that means basically you're turning the light fully on and fully off, back and forth, let's say, a thousand times a second, but you're spending 50% of the time with it on, 50% off. Your eyes aren't going to notice the flicker, but they will notice that the brightness of that light is 50% of what it would be if it was on all the time. And that's the quickest way to control something not just on or off, but actually anywhere in between from software. And that's also, by the way, how a cordless drill works. You have a cordless battery-powered drill, and when you pull the trigger halfway, there's a circuit inside the drill that, based on the position of your finger, is deciding how much percentage of the time the battery is fully connected to the motor versus not connected at all. And that's that sound that you hear, is that change being made back and forth on and off. So this is um, this is solid state relay, and it's a transistor inside, but it's not a MOSFET. It's actually a triac, which is two silicon controlled resistors back to back. And the details are not important for you here. What you need to know is that these things are really easy to use with your microcontroller because all you have to do is connect your microcontroller to the bottom two pins, or screw, they're actually screw terminals, and then you can connect the top two screw terminals to whatever load you want. The catch is this only works for AC, stuff that you plug into the wall. But if you look at the rating there, 25 amps, 240 volts AC, those are the maximum ratings for this part. That means that you could turn on the electric heater of your hot tub with this, no problem. Your stove, you know, um, a kiln, all kinds of stuff, really powerful things, as well as, you know, just an ordinary reading lamp or uh, the lights in your room or anywhere. And, um, and an important aspect of this, this part is that it electrically isolates the screws at the top from the screws at the bottom. And that means that when you touch the wiring of your Arduino that's connected to the bottom screws, you can't get a shock from the electricity that's on the top two screws, which you certainly can get a shock from. And this is a diagram of one of those in use. And uh, I hope that this diagram is pretty simple. I didn't make it, but I admire it greatly. It has a weird plug on it, but I still think it's awesome. And as you can see, it's really simple. You just connect ground and the pin of your choice from the Arduino to that module. And then on the top, those two screws just go in series with the load like you would have a light switch. But, like I said, this module only works for AC, like stuff that's plugged into the wall. And another thing is that you, you, you can't use PWM, like I was talking about, pulse width modulation, to control the brightness of a lamp with this without a little bit more circuitry and a little bit more complex programming, which you can totally do, but uh, it's a little bit more complex. And uh, it ends up being just like a lamp dimmer, you know, the knob on the wall that controls the brightness in your dining room. 
Yeah. See you, Dave. Yeah. Omni-oasis. Omni-oasis. Thank you, Dave. Come back all the time. This is a servo motor. And you might have seen these on our, uh, remote control cars or little remote control planes or whatever else. And this is a motor that you can control pretty easily from a microcontroller, and it has a lot of magic inside. And because normally when you have a motor, if you just ever connect a little motor to a battery, you'll notice that it spins really fast, but not a lot of power. You can stop it with your finger, and there's not necessarily anything on the end of it that you can connect to something to make it do something. And uh, you certainly can't tell it to turn a quarter of a turn and stay there. And a servo motor does have that. It's got a lot of gears inside so that the motor in there, which does spin really fast and not have a lot of power, is geared down to this thing on the outside that has an arm on there that allows you to connect a paper clip or stick or something, whatever it is that you want it to turn or move. And also, there's a bunch of electronics <coughs> inside a servo that allow it to take a signal from a microcontroller or analog circuitry and that signal tells it what position you want it to be in. So you tell it, I want you to be at zero degrees, and it'll move there with, with quite a bit of force. And when you tell it, go to 45 degrees, it'll move there pretty quickly and with a lot of force, and it'll stay there until, you, until the signal that you're giving it changes to some other position. And um, the only thing that you need to hook that up to your Arduino is, um, is just a wire. That's the nice thing. Is you, I mean, you have to you have to make sure that because it, it runs on the same voltage as the Arduino, five volts. Uh, although some of them you can run on six or more volts to give them a little more power. But the point is that you don't need anything fancy to steer one of these servos. You just connect it, and then there's a, a software subroutine that again does controls the timer subprocessor, and it's using timing to send the signals to the servo motor and tell it what position to be in. And that's really handy. And you can have a whole bunch of them connected to one microcontroller if you want. And uh, if, you're, if your software is uh, control the joints on a 16-legged spider, you know, three joints on each leg, and you have that many servos, then you can certainly make a robot that has a whole bunch of articulated legs. The other thing is that they make servos um, which don't have, that the, so the circuitry inside them is a little bit simpler and they don't have the position sensing function, which also means that they don't, they're not limited to a half a turn or a full turn. They can turn continuously. And in that case, the signal that you're sending them is basically one of three things. Stay where you are, turn clockwise, or turn counterclockwise. But you still don't need any extra circuitry to make that happen, and so they're really handy for a lot of things that you want to build. But you can't control the speed. Um, and. Uh, I want to go back a little bit. I skipped over this part. This is the beginning of the input section of the talk, which is using your circuit, your Arduino or your microcontroller, whatever kind it is, because they all have analog inputs, using that to detect things from the outside world. So in this case, you see a regular knob, like a volume knob, and it's wired up to the 5-volt and the ground pins, and those are on the outer parts of the knob. The way the knob works is that the position of that knob that you can turn decides what, uh, where the blue wire is connected along a gradient from where the black wire is connected to the red wire is connected. So if that's 5 volts across it and you call the black wire 0 and you call the red wire 5, then when you turn the knob to the middle position, the blue wire is going to see 2.5. And that means that that analog in that is plugged into input 2, when your software asks what's the number on input 2, it's going to give you a 512, whereas a full 5 volts would give you a 1023, and all the way down to 0 volts would give you a 0. So you get a number that corresponds to where along the rotation of that knob it's turned. Um, by the way, that's assuming that that knob is a uh, linear plot. A lot of audio circuitry uses a knob that looks the same, but it's going to have an A on the back, and it's what's called an audio taper. It has a logarithmic curve to it, and that can be confusing, so just be aware of that. Um, 
And, and then when you see that you can hook up this knob, you can also hook up the knob physically to any number of things in the world, like for example, a float in a, in a pond uh, to see where the water level is, um, or um, a big flap that measure that's connected to a spring and an airflow thing, so you can see how fast air is flowing through a thing. Um, and in this uh, example right here, this is one of like the hello worlds of hardware. They they've connected a knob to the Arduino, and they've connected a servo to the Arduino, and they're pro they're almost certainly telling it, take the position of that knob, read it in as an analog value determine what the angle of the knob is, and then instruct the servo to go to the same position. And uh, that's just kind of a hello world. This right here, uh, by the way, is kind of like the knob thing. If you want to measure something that is not a knob with the three wires, where it's the voltage is, is going along a, a long transistor like that, it's a mechanical solution. If you're trying to measure something like a light sensor, a photoresistor, which is a light sensor, there's flex sensors that um, there are these little things that you can physically push on or squeeze and their resistance changes. Um, or a temperature sensor, an analog temperature sensor known as a thermistor, is the cheapest way to measure temperature electronically. And all of those things are basically a resistor with two wires, and the value that you're trying to measure is what is the resistance of that component. And the way that you do that with one of these analog input pins is that you have to have another resistor to counterbalance it because the analog input is comparing. It's looking at the voltage there, and it's effectively in this circuit, it's comparing the resistance of whatever your sensor is to that fixed known value resistor. So with the temperature sensor, you would choose a fixed resistor that was around the range of resistances you would see in the middle of your scale of temperatures that you were interested in. So if you wanted to make, for example, a fridge controller or a, uh, a, a mushroom cultivating uh, environment where you wanted to have the temperature just right, this is the quickest and cheapest way to do it. There's also something called a... Um, a digitally communicating temperature sensor like a DS1820B. That's what I use these days, DS18B20. And those don't communicate through the analog pin. They communicate digitally, kind of like Ethernet or serial. And those things are nice because you don't have to measure the resistances or kind of calibrate it or pick a resistor. You just get the software communicating with those sensors, and then they tell you the, the temperature in degrees, and they're very accurate. So. We've been talking about Arduinos because that's kind of the quickest and easiest uh, way to interface with hardware. One of the reasons for that is that they deal in 5-volt logic. That means that when an output pin is told to be high, it connects to 5 volts. And when it's told to be low, it connects to 0 volts. The other thing is Arduinos have quite a bit of current on their output pins. They have enough power to light up an LED pretty brightly. Uh, or you know, they, they can kind of do a lot with uh, that force. And the Arduino, uh, which is just an Atmega chip made by Atmel Company, um, that line of chips and similar chips are pretty much the only things you'll find where the outputs are directly 5 volts and directly strong. Everything else, like all the things that you see here, these are all Linux-capable system-on chips or system-on boards. They all use, they all end up using 3.3 volt logic. And what that means is that when you tell an output pin to be high, it's connected to 3.3 volts. And one of the things that I showed you early on, controlling a motor with a transistor, you can get transistors that will turn on and off at 5 volts, but the ones that, turn, that are really fully on at 3.3 volts are a little less common and a little harder to find. And so it's, it, it's just something to be aware of. Um, also, the solid state relays, some of them won't quite work at 3.3 volts. And it also depends on how much current your system on chip can uh, supply. But the nice thing about all these things here on this page is that these are real Linux computers, and they can, they can 
run Node, they can run whatever software you come up with. They have a lot of resources on board. <coughs> they have Ethernet, full network stacks, display connections where you can hook up a screen if you want to. Uh, but you know, there's just that little catch of when you go to interfacing with the hardware world, it's a little bit more tricky. Uh, the, another thing, and this is important, is if you fry an Arduino uh, by hooking up the wrong thing to the pin and then blowing it up, you can just pop that chip out and throw in another $3 chip and it's fine. But with these things, the general purpose I.O. pins that are connected to those headers that you're wiring your stuff up to, they go directly into the CPU. There's no mediary there. And that means that if you hook up the wrong thing to one of those pins, the entire board can become useless, dead, CPU, dead. And that's sad. And that's no fun to do while you're experimenting and learning. So this is kind of not, this shouldn't be your first experiment. You should use a Arduino because they're more durable and disposable. Uh, speaking of durable and disposable, old routers, they're not necessarily durable, but they are disposable in the sense that there are piles of them all over the place. And my friend Dana made this really awesome instructable on exactly how you can use an old router to uh, turn things on and off. Um, GP, you know, general purpose I.O. pins and, uh, and, and analog inputs sometimes. They don't always have analog inputs, but various stuff like that. Um, these things, they are a system on chip just like the stuff that we were looking at here. The difference is that while each of these, you know, these are sub $50, so okay, only $35 or only $30 for the cheap ones. But wireless routers are piling up in hacker spaces near you. <laughs> and if you know how to work these things, you know how to program them, put Linux on them, um, run your favorite programming language on them, then you might not have to spend anything at all. And another thing is that they're, um, they're, they're a little bit more flexible in the sense that their power supply input is usually more like 12 volts and uh, that's handy. The other thing is that they always have wireless built in, and they have Ethernet ports, and they have, um, you know, they, they have a, pretty much everything that you would need out of one of these for a lot of the kind of stuff that I'm envisioning, like, for example, uh, controlling things in your yard or turning lights on and off. They've got it. And another important thing, and this is what I really recommend keeping in mind, is that while some of these only have a few general purpose I.O. pins from the CPU that you can hook up to things and turn things on and off, albeit 3.3 volts, they all have a serial port. And that serial port is, do you remember when we were looking at the Arduino in uh, the second and uh, third slide, I showed the diagram and I said, the diagram of the Arduino is that there's the computer there and then there's the USB interface. That's the other chip on there. And that chip is there to allow you to plug the Arduino into the USB port of your computer. And that's to give you a serial interface to the chip on the Arduino. Well, that serial interface between the USB chip and the Arduino chip, that's just serial. It's called TTL serial. It's a signaling, uh, hardware signaling method that uh, is really common among this small stuff. And since the uh, routers, and all of these things too, but the routers have that serial port and the chip on an Arduino, which is just a chip. I mean, you don't need the Arduino board to have a program running on one of those chips. Also has serial. You can connect them together directly. So you can take one of these routers and then one or more chips like what you put on an Arduino, which are only $3, connect them together and you can have all of the hardware interfacing, 5-volt logic, high current input and output stuff, as well as the disposability factor in case you mess up of an Arduino, along with uh, a more Linux friendly, um, a more serious computing platform that you find in a router running OpenWRT. So that's a good combination. Um, and uh, this right here, this is I don't know if, if any of you have been using Arduinos, but in there you can turn a pin on and off with a command like digital write 5 comma high. That would turn pin 5 on. But when you're running an OpenWRT router, 
it can get a little bit more complicated to turn pins on and off, but this is, these are shell commands. And um, the fact that you can do it at all from the shell is pretty neat. Uh, and this right here is how you do it on uh, the latest flavor of open work that you would flash onto a router. And um, I'll explain what the different lines are. Just not that you should remember this or anything, but just to realize it's not hard. Um, the first command is to basically disconnect the, uh, the general purpose I.O. pins from this LED driver subsystem, which is a software layer that allows things like network events or traffic activities or whatever to turn lights on and off on the device for user information. And it, this, that first command just says, just, I don't want that, just disconnect the GPIO from that software layer and let me control it myself. The second line is telling the system, I want, to, I want you to create virtual devices for GPIO pin number six. And then once that happens, once you do that, then, you, then there becomes a thing called Sys Devices Virtual GPIO, GPIO six. It suddenly exists. And then you can echo low to direction of GPIO six and that turns it into an output, which normally it defaults to being an input. And the next three lines are intended to be in a, in a shell script. That's why there's the bin sh. But the point is that when you echo one to sys devices virtual GPIO, GPIO six value, it turns that pin to a logical high of, or 3.3 volts. When you echo low to it, it turns back off. And if that pin happens to be connected to a solid state relay that's connected to, um, you know, a giant uh, two horsepower klaxon siren in your front yard, then you can log in from Australia and make a really loud noise at your house if you want. <laughs> or activate the blender or whatever it is. Um, so this is a circuit that is for shifting the levels of, let's say, a 3.3 volt um, CPU to a 5 volt kind of thing. And it's not very well labeled, but the point is that there's a few parts there. If you have a 3.3 volt um, CPU and you want to use a transistor with a little bit more capability of turning things on and off, then you can use a few little components. And it's not a big deal. The, the squares are, are just um, resistors and the other things are different kind of transistor. But this is kind of the ugly way to do it. This right here is a chip, a 74LS245, which is a eight channel logic buffer. And you can use a chip like that to take eight general purpose I.O. pins from your, uh, like your, your Linux system on chip, Raspberry Pi, BeagleBone Black, whatever, and have the outputs be five volts and a little bit more durable. Another advantage to doing this, besides having them five volts, is that if you hook up the wrong thing to those pins, it's gonna blow up the 74LS245 chip, but that's a throwaway part. You can pop it out of the socket, stick in another one, and your Linux computer on a on chip thing, BeagleBone, Raspberry thing, is protected. Uh, this chip only goes in one direction. Oh no, this, wait, this one goes in two directions. You see the DUR pin? So, um, I would have to look closer at that chip. To, that I don't think this is actually uh, an actual example because the, if this chip is running at five volts, it's gonna end up putting five volts into the device of yours and you don't want that. But the point is that you can just say, I just wanna do eight pins that are a higher level. Now this thing right here, this chip, is specifically for the purpose of amplifying the outputs of a microcontroller or small um, circuit to the levels used by a really high power transistor. And not only does it amplify the levels in the sense that you know your microcontroller might be, uh, oh, I, I should mention you know Andro uh, Android phones and tablets and things like that. Those are also you can wire into those and you can access the GPIO on that. You can take an Android phone and open it up and solder the points on the board and turn those things on and off. And those things can be 2.5 volt logic. It's even lower than 3.3. You're not gonna find a transistor that you can turn a car headlight on and off with or whatever it is that you wanna control. 
But this chip will allow you to connect the delicate output of your microcontroller to its input and its output, which you give on a pin 6 BCC, you'll give it like 12 volts. And then the outputs will exactly mirror the state of the microcontroller's pins, high or low. But they'll go between 0 and 12 volts instead of 0 and 2.5 volts or 0 and 3.3 volts. And it's got a lot of power. And again, this chip, you know, you can pull it out and replace it if you mess it up. It's going to protect your microcontroller. And an important aspect of using this chip is that if you're doing, like I was saying, PWM, where you're controlling uh, the power level of something by the percentage of time that the pin spends on versus off, uh, you, you might be switching that pin on and off at a very high rate, like 35,000 times a second or something. And when you're doing that, it's really important that when you turn the transistor on or off, that you do it as quickly as possible because all the time that you linger in, the, in between range, the transistor is heating up. And this chip allows your microcontroller to make those rapid changes and uh, doesn't let the transistor fight back or slow it down at all because this chip has a lot of power to tell the transistor, turn on all the way right now, turn off all the way right now. It's called a MOSFET driver chip. But you don't have to remember any of this because you can always ask me later if you end up actually needing any of this information. So um, I forgot to, or I ran out of time or whatever to make more slides about the, uh, the last thing that I should be talking about. But basically, if you're doing something where you've gotten your software into an Arduino or one of those little system on chips that we were looking at, Beagle Bone Pie or whatever, you're going to want to power that. And you might be powering that thing. I mean, the easiest way, of course, is usually they're powered by a micro USB, like a cell phone charger. And you can just, if it's an installation, you can just plug it into the wall with a cell phone charger to power it. But sometimes you're going to be powering that stuff off of a battery. And if you're making, let's say, a, a you know, a robotic uh, thing that scoots around on the floor, and your microcontroller is the brain, there's a battery in there, like a cordless drill battery or whatever, and You've learned now how to use transistors to turn motors on and off from your microcontroller, but then what powers your microcontroller? And the answer is there are a lot of little DC to DC converter boards that you can get on eBay for like $2, $3 that take the voltage of the battery, whether it's you know 9 volts when it's dead or 15 volts or 25 volts when it's fully charged or while it's charging and it just brings it down to a nice 5.0 volts, which is what your computer needs to run, your microcontroller, your Beagle Bone Black, or whatever. And uh, that's just one example of the kinds of electronic solutions that you can find on eBay if you want to like do this kind of thing, but you don't want to, you want to do something a little bit more complicated than a single transistor like I've been showing here, but you don't want to actually design a board and get really into the depths of stuff. If you're doing something common like that, there are solutions that you can get for amazingly cheap. I mean, I'm talking like two dollars, including shipping, mailed to you from China, that will allow you to, for example, control a stepper motor um, without having to, uh, without having to drop and make your own circuit board and do crazy stuff. You just wire things in. And there's too many solutions of that kind of stuff for me to list here. But be sure, you know, be aware, like. Anything that you want to do electronically um, from your software, you want to make something happen, even if it's really big, it's, it's just a couple of questions away and you can definitely do it. So think of your software as not just a philosophical exercise in displaying something on the screen, but you can make physical things happen in the real world and also take information from them. So um, I hope that people have questions. Now's your chance to uh, ask any question you've ever wondered about making something happen from a computer or having a computer measure or, or look at something. Hi. What are some good starter projects? Some good starter projects. Yeah, what's you have an Arduino? I think that one of the coolest things to do with an Arduino would be to uh, make a thing that scoots around on the floor, 
like a, like a little robot where you can program it to, uh, and, and this is really, actually one of the easiest ways to do that is with a Roomba because uh, they have a serial interface that's pretty well documented where you can send it commands and tell it, you know, drive forward, turn left, whatever. And uh, there's also a lot of things, I, I saw one of these things in the junk pile at Noise Bridge and actually there was one here and it might still be here. It's basically a little um, platform that has a place to put your Arduino and a place to put little batteries and two motors and uh, a little bit of circuitry to make it so that you can tell them to go forward or go backward, uh, which is something I didn't cover here, by the way, making a motor go backward. That's something that we use at H-Bridge, but if anybody's curious about how to do that and you, you don't find what you want by looking for H-Bridge, I'll be glad to tell you it's, it's not very hard. You just have to choose direction in addition to is the motor on or off. But um, those little robots where you can control the two motors and drive them around the floor, that's really fun to make it go around. And it's the same kind of thing that you would do if you had went to Radio Shack and got one of those Christmas toys with the remote control. The difference is that when it's computerized, you can put a program in there and you could make it ro crawl around on the floor um, in the exact pattern of your name. And if you're going to do that, you could also put a little can of paint with a hole at the bottom and put it in the middle of the highway, and you can have it write your name on the highway in really, really, really big letters. So that's the kind of thing that is really simple. Maybe that's not a starter project. Um, I think a good starter project depends on what kind of materials you have laying around. Like if you have a transistor for DC, then you could take some sort of a DC. Um, uh, oh, I forgot to mention speakers, but I guess we can already plug speakers into our laptop. So. Um, if you were to take a transistor and a battery, and you can power that Arduino directly from like a 12 volt battery, because it's got a regulator built in, so it can run on 12 volts. And you use that transistor, you can uh, connect the transistor to a light bulb, like a like not not a car headlight bulb for your first project, because that's a lot of power. But let's say like a tail light bulb, like a brake light bulb from a car. Connect that to a transistor, to a pin on the Arduino, and then put this thing with the battery um, on some place and write a program that says some, um, di uh, some devious message in Morse code, maybe with your phone number, I don't know, or your email address, and you put this thing somewhere where a lot of people can see it, some weird place, a rooftop or something, and you just have it clicking out Morse code with this light. You just wait until you get a phone call or an email or something like that. And it'll be from some really, really old World War II veteran or maybe somebody who was in Vietnam and they'll be like, I, I just don't understand what you're doing. Like, what is this? Who are you? Why are you doing this? What is this for your Morse code? And it's not a blinking, a lot of people are going to see the blinking light, but, and actually probably, I think it's more likely that whoever calls you is going to be somebody not who knows Morse code, but knows what it is. And then they'll look at it and they'll get out a notepad and they'll like write it down and they'll look up Morse code and they'll figure out how to transpose it. And that could be really interesting. It could be fun. A question. An old CD drive? Or something like what kinds of things are valuable for doing things? Well, old desktop computers are full of good stuff. Um, well, maybe not, maybe not full of them, but certainly the power supply in an old desktop computer is the kind of thing that you should pull out before you send it to e-waste if the power supply still works, because um, that's a nice source of 12 volts. Although you can also get that from the brick of uh, like a lot of things, like old LCD monitors and things like that, the the brick is a good source of power for experiments. Um, well, let's see. Oh, oh, here's a good one. Okay, the hard drive of a computer, the, the spinny kind, not the modern SSDs, but you're not taking those apart yet. Take a hard drive from a computer apart, and um, maybe you'll wreck the first one, but um, the first or second hard drive that you take apart You'll notice that inside there's the platters, and those are really fun. They make wonderful bells and wind chimes. 
So what you do is you take the hard, you take the lid off the hard drive, and this is with the star screws. So you'll need a modern computer disassembly kit or whatever kind of kit that's got all the different sizes of the star screws, the Torx screws. You take the lid off the hard drive, and you'll see the platters. And if you take about six screws out, you can take the platters out. And in the process of taking the platters out, you're going to notice the read-write heads, which are like the tone arm on a record player, except that there's one on the top and bottom of each of the platter, and there might be two or three or more platters in the hard drive. And these tone arms are going to get a little beat up in the process of taking the platters out. But you take the platters out, you tie them into a wind chime, and then, and that's fine. But what remains is this tone arm, the read-write heads of the hard drive. And this is really cool. You're going to take the circuit board off the other side of the hard drive, by the way. And um, what you'll notice is that there's really powerful magnets right there on the tone arm. And it's fun to take those magnets out and stick them to things that are really powerful. But you've got a stack of hard drives, and you've already got all the magnets you need for that kind of stuff. And now you want to say, wait, why are these magnets in there? What are they for? And the answer is, in the same way that a speaker works, where you feed a, a varying voltage up and down into the speaker wires and causes the speaker to come out and push air out towards you, and then you reverse the polarity and the speaker paper pulls in and it creates a negative pressure wave and that's how the sound happens. In a hard drive, the read-write heads, the tone arm, instead of like a record player where it slowly goes from the out, outer part to the inner part, in a hard drive, the read-write heads have to constantly go inward and outward according to the data that you're trying to access. And the way they do that is just like with a speaker where there's an electromagnetic coil and a stationary magnet. And what that means is that if you find the right two wires coming from that coil on the tone arm assembly, which is uh, going to be the, basically the two thickest conductors on the little ribbon cable coming from that thing, which of course goes back to the circuit board. So if you look at where the circuit board used to connect to this whole assembly, this tone arm thing, You'll find those two wires, and if you're poking around with the multimeter on ohms mode, you'll find that it's probably like two or three or four, some number of ohms of resistance. When you find that, you can actually just hook that up to an audio amplifier and play sound into it, and the tone arm will move back and forth according to the exact sound that you're playing into the amplifier. And if you were to take a stick, like a paper clip, and connect it to that tone arm, and then put, let's say, a piece of paper on the end of that stick, it's suddenly a speaker. So um, you, can, you can use it for that kind of thing. Some people use them to pick locks because the, the thing can move back and forth really fast and you can put a lock pick on the end of the tone arm and vibrate it just right and it'll, it makes a pretty interesting vibrating style lock picker. Um, and another really neat thing you can do and that I look forward to doing here is that you can take one of these tone arms and, um, and put a mirror on the hinge and bounce a little laser pen off of the mirror. And when you play sound, for example, into, um, into the voice coil, it's going to move the laser beam back and forth between two extremes. You're going to want some sort of a rubber band or something to hold the, uh, or to, to kind of pull the tone arm uh, of the hard drive, the read-write head assembly, toward the middle of its travel, the middle of the magnets, because otherwise it'll wander over to one end. But the idea is that now the sound that you're playing into that um, motor is causing the laser beam to move back and forth in a straight line. And when you aim it at something, you're going to see a straight line, but if you then move the hard drive in the direction of, or move the, la the hard drive laser assembly, it's going to have to be hot glued together. But you move the whole assembly to the side a little bit, suddenly you're seeing a waveform of that sound, um, like an oscilloscope kind of thing. And then, if you really want to get crazy, you take another hard drive apart, and you do the same thing again, where you put a mirror on the tone arm, and you make it so that the laser will bounce off of one mirror and then off of the other one. And you make them perpendicular, so you have X, Y, and you play the sound into one of them and into the other one you play a sawtooth, which you can generate with studio.substack.net to see what it looks like. You can also make it with an electronic signal. But you know, your laptop's already got two channels of output, so you're just gonna generate one channel with one side of your 
sound card and the, maybe the music with the other side. But the point is now you have an oscilloscope projector, and that can be a lot of fun at parties. If you, you know, tell your computer to take the microphone input and uh, and plot it on the wall like an like like an oscilloscope with a laser, that can be a lot of fun. Um, you can see the bass, you can see the music, see somebody's voice while they're talking, and then if you get that working, um, you can. There's a whole software package for Linux. I forget what it's called, but it's a like Linux laser something. And the idea is that you can take a path, like an SVG or um, any image path, and it will convert that into an audio track left and right for the X and Y um, of a laser projector. And you can take an image of your choice and play it out the sound card, and it'll move those two read-write heads back and forth in just the right way to cause your, your laser pen to, pr to trace that path on the wall. And this can be really far away. You know, you could be outside at a demonstration and have some huge political cartoon on the side of a building from a device that you're holding in your hand that's powered by a tiny battery or even your laptop's USB port. So those are kind of cool things that you can definitely do with, uh, with electronics. <laughs> Actually, uninterruptible power supplies are a reliable place to get um, end-channel MOSFETs from. You know, those big, bulky, old ones that nobody uses anymore. Um, those things have, you'll see a big, like, aluminum heat sink in there that's got a bunch of identical transistors on there. That's because for the power that they're trying to get through there, they put a whole bunch of transistors in parallel in order to reduce the losses. They kind of know, all pulling on the same rope kind of thing. And when you take those apart, you can actually crack that heat sink off of the circuit board in just the right way, uh, like our ancestors would crack um, sea creatures open to get the meat. And then you get a whole bunch of transistors. And, uh, and they're not the best transistors, but they're certainly easily available out of the junk pile. Is that AC to uh, DC converter? Oh, a DC to DC converter? Is, that, is this what you're talking about? No, no, I'm talking about uninterruptible power supplies, the kind that's got a big dead lead acid battery inside, and when you plug it in, it beeps until you unplug it. Uh, and we, don't, we don't necessarily have any, uh, any more he here. I think that the one on the stage might have been, I, I like to take those things apart and turn them into power strips, and just hollow them out, that kind anyway. But, um, uh, you, you don't need to take things apart to get these transistors, though, because I have tons of them, and Adam has tons of them, and if you want transistors, you just let me know, and I'll, I'll hand them to you. They're easy, they're cheap. You know, um, As far as like pulling stuff out of e-waste, I'd say that routers are a good thing to get out of there, although don't be surprised if the one that you get is, um, is uh, hopelessly defective, because the quality level of consumer-grade routers is just incredibly bad. So don't feel bad when you fry it or when it reboots when you least want it to or it stops working. Although I think that might be an issue with the software. You put your own software on it and it doesn't work. Seth, I know you have a question. What is it? Um, you run a Pi operation with one battery and the battery dies. And the Pi is not, does it, does it shut down in control manner? You might try to SD card. Is, is that like a, a software solution? That is an excellent question, excellent question. So he's saying when you run a Raspberry Pi off of a, let's say, a car battery powered by a solar panel kind of thing, um, then you want to make sure that for whatever, for whatever reason when your battery runs out and you, um, you need to stop taking power from it, your whole system has to shut down for whatever reason, you ha but this will happen. Um, you don't want the Raspberry Pi to shut off. Well, first of all, Raspberry Pi can only run on five volts. It won't run on 12 volts, it'll blow up. So you've got a converter in there to take the 12 volts down to five volts. And um, the cheapest, easiest way to do that is with these things that's meant for the cigarette lighter socket in the car to charge a cell phone. Those things are great because 
It's meant for a car for 12 volts, but you can give it anywhere from 7 to like 25 volts. It doesn't care. But the point is, when your battery is getting low and you are gonna, your computer is going to shut off for whatever reason, you don't want it to just, just have the power disappear or even brown out to where the CPU is not acting right because the voltage isn't quite there. You want it to detect that and then shut down in a controlled way, because otherwise you could foul your SD card or something bad could happen. So the answer is you write a, um, for example, in that situation, you write a shell script that pulls the um, one of the GPIO pins. And that means, uh, you know, that maybe on a cron job or something that's like keeping an eye on the state of one of the inputs. I don't know if the Raspberry Pi has analog inputs or not. I don't think it does, but it's got digital inputs. The difference being an analog input, like I was saying earlier, you pull it and it gives you a number, and that number, let's say from 0 to 1023, represents the voltage. But in a digital input, it's only going to give you a 0 or a 1. Electrically, that typically means is the voltage above or below the halfway point between, let's say, three point, the pi is 3.3 volts logic, so if the voltage is less than 1 point something, 1.8 volts, then, uh, or 1 point, I don't know, 6 volts, then uh, it's going to give you a logic 0, and if it's above that voltage, it'll give you a logic 1. So how do you use that to tell you whether your battery is dead or not? And the answer is, the easiest way is that you pick a voltage that your battery is considered dead at. And I'll tell you, with a lead-acid battery, like a car battery or a gel cell, that's 10.6 volts. There's not much more electrical energy in the battery when it gets down to that voltage, so you might as well consider it dead. And furthermore, if you drain it past there, it's going to damage the battery and reduce its usefulness in the future. So, you take a circuit to, that, that when the voltage is above 10.6 volts, the pi is going to see a logical high, and when it's below, it sees a logical low. And that would be a voltage divider. And uh, just like I was doing on the in this one diagram where I was saying how you would, um, oh, my mouse is gone, um, where, where you would uh, measure something that was just a resistor. Uh, like this, it's the same kind of thing, except it, it's a different situation. Instead of the analog input pin, that's going to be a digital input pin. And both of the resistors are going to be fixed resistors. And where it says 5 volts, that's the car battery voltage. And what you're doing is you're making it so that when the car battery voltage is 10.6 volts, those resistors, kind of like a couple of bungee cords that are different lengths, the midpoint between them is going to be 1.65 volts when the uh, when the, the voltage at the top is 10.6. And that means if the battery voltage is above 10.6, the input pin, the digital input pin on the Raspberry Pi will see above 1.65 volts. And when it's below the dead point of 10.6 volts on the battery, then proportionally the input, the digital input on the Raspberry Pi is going to be below 1.65 volts. And the difference is that the software is going to register a logical zero below that point. And then you're, when your software detects that, it says, that's it, the battery's dead, shut it down, and it turns off. And uh, that's nice and all, but then what do you do when the, um, well, the thing is, you, you want to actually do something do something where not only does the software shut off and close the disk and come to a halt, but maybe you're using your CPU to actually control stuff and decide uh, to power itself off. And if you do that, then you're going to have an output from the Raspberry Pi that is kind of like a turn everything off button. You know the machine that when you turn it on, the, a motor comes alive and this finger comes out of the box and flips the switch back off? So, in this outdoor installation, you're going to have something which says when the voltage is below a certain voltage, turn everything off, stop taking power. Ideally, that's going to be something outside the Pi. So, so for Seth, that means that all he's got to do is just say, if that voltage goes too low, then halt and shut off the disks. But then what do you do when the voltage comes back up? The sun comes up and the sun starts shining and the battery gets recharged. 
is the, is the pie going to sit there in a, in a wait loop? I think that probably the answer is um, you want to have another input that measures the battery um, to see if it's above, let's say, a higher voltage. Because if you just say, sit in that loop and wait until the voltage goes above 10.6 again, that could happen. That'll happen as soon as uh, some other things turn off. What you want is another input that's wired up with different resistors to a different input that's going to tell you when the voltage goes above 12 volts or 11 or whatever. And then um, that loop that closed all the disks and prepared the pie for shutting down, that loop is also going to be looking at that other input when it sees that that one is high, uh, then it'll it'll reboot and start operating again. Um, and then the other way to do it, if the Pi had an analog input, would be that it would just read the voltage and just make the decisions based on that. What do you think? Is that a good answer? Okay, Arduino do that. Well, if you have an Arduino that's got analog inputs, and then you're just going to connect one of those analog inputs up to the battery voltage with the same kind of arrangement I was saying with two two um, resistors. The difference there is you're going to make it so that you know when the battery is like 10 volts or something, then the analog input will be 5 volts. I mean, 2.5 volts, so that the range of voltages you expect from the battery is never going to be above 5, which is the maximum that it can. And then anywhere in between, it's just going to read that analog input, and you can just map that in software to the actual voltage of the battery. And that's good, because that means that if you're in communication with this Pi, you can ask it, hey, what's the battery look like? How's, what's the voltage there? And that's important information. So if you have an analog input, then that's the right way to do it, is to measure the voltage of the battery and that, make your decisions that way. Anybody else? Are we done? So the question is, at what point do you want to make your own PC board, your own circuit board? And that um, depends on a lot of things. It depends on how complex your circuit is and uh, how, um, how many of these things you're going to make is another big factor. It also depends on your style. Um, people who enjoy making circuit boards, like Adam in there, he uh, discovered that he had made a, a mistake on the board, which he would, would be able to put little wires on there and make a correction. But um, he was bothered enough by it that he said, no, forget it. I'm just making a whole new board. I'm going to build it again. So, uh, But the other thing is that his board, there's no way that you can build the thing that he made without making a custom circuit board for it. So it really depends on, on how many things you're trying to wire together and how many uh, of these things you intend to make and uh, how excited you are about making the circuit board. It's actually pretty cheap these days to make circuit boards. And I feel that the skill of designing a circuit board with CAD software, which is something I'd be glad to show people, is a very valuable skill. It allows you to realize what's possible if you decide to design something electronic and make up a whole bunch of them. So you might as well learn that skill in practice early on. Even if you don't really need to make a board for your project, it is really nice to do that. And the nice thing about making a board for something is that if you do like it and you want to make more, then you don't have to go through the process of designing the board again. You just make more boards and then you assemble them. And actually, assembling things when there's a circuit board for all the parts is really fun. It's just, it's like being by numbers. You just put the parts in there, you solder them in place, and it's really, really fun. And you have a nice thing when it's done. So, I would say um, it's a personal decision when you, get, when you get to the point of making a custom circuit board, but um, it's always an option. For some things you can't get away without it. For other things, it's uh, it's not necessary, but sometimes people do it anyway. Oh, also, um, we have a CNC machine now in the other room, although I think the owner is going to take it back for a little while. But there are various ways for us to make circuit boards ourselves. 
without having to send away and pay a company to make it and then send it to us. And if you're interested in any of those methods, let me know and I'll tell you everything you know. We have some of the materials here. this uh, 
um, this logical busing. So just like having a whole bunch of computers on a network, each one has its own unique MAC address or IP address, you can address them. These temperature sensors are the same way. So that uh, means that if your inputs are something like temperature, you can use a package solution like that. It only takes one pin. Can you run dozens of scripts at the same time with Can you run what? <laughs> can you run dozens of scripts at the same time on the same Arduino? So my answer is yes, but um, you have to write the task manager yourself. And I feel that that's an important aspect of programming is knowing how to, to kind of rate your priorities and stuff. It's the kind of thing that's done for you in functional programming, in my understanding, or in modern operating systems where you can run multiple programs. But back in my day when computers uh, ran directly on gasoline, uh, there was only one program running at a time. And if you wanted to run another program, you had to quit that program and then run the other one. And uh, that's the way it is on an Arduino. You're running a sketch, and that's the sketch that it's running. And so if you wanted to do two things at the same time, you have to manually integrate those two programs. And the way that I would say you do that is that in the main loop, well, there's two ways to do it. One is with interrupts. I don't necessarily recommend that, depending on what it is. But uh, the way to do it without interrupts is that you have the main loop polling the different tasks that you want to accomplish to check on them and see, does this process need any updating? Does that process need any updating? And, uh, and, and you know, a lot of programmers should be able to show you how to do that if you don't know what I mean. But definitely, yeah, you can have a whole lot of different things running on in Arduino, because even though it's probably the slowest computer that most of us ever play with, it's still pretty fast compared to a person. Have you known anyone who's written a task manager for an Arduino? I don't know of anyone who's written a task manager for an Arduino, but I'm sure they're out there. I just don't know who they are. Um, but the next step up from an Arduino, you know, is starting to get toward these the little Linux computers and like the the open work routers, which are not much faster. I mean, they're they're many times faster than an Arduino, but they're still pretty slow. They have real time operating systems. They run Linux, and of course, Linux kernel has the ability to manage many applications at the same time, and that's a luxury that we have today as programmers. But when you're down to the, as they say, down to the metal on an Arduino, you're really just deciding what's it going to do and then what's it going to do after that. And you're not necessarily writing an assembler, although some people do. But um, but uh, you are telling the microprocessor exactly what you want it to do at every moment. This is a project that a friend of mine made using a microcontroller where the entire, um, everything that happens is, uh, it's totally the wrong site. Uh, where everything that happens is, uh, it's an assembler in there. They're just dictating everything. So this is the finished product, which is a very nice handcrafted uh, Nixie tube clock. And you can't, you know, handcraft a circuit board and hand wire and hand etch all of the plates for a project like this and then let the C compiler make all your code, especially if it's a clock and you don't want any, any um, question about what's happening. So he wrote the entire program in Assembler. And in Assembler, a comment starts with a semicolon. And this is what you call literally down to the metal. This is where each of these lines ends up, I mean, just gets compiled directly into a couple of bytes. So this R jump, there's going to be a certain, I think it's a 12 bit instruction that says R jump. And then after that, it's some bits that say relatively or absolutely where in memory to go to. And this reset, this is just a way for the human to tell the compiler, I don't want to have to count how many bytes from here 
to here, which is the way that people used to have to do it. So I want the compiler to count for me and then just put the number in this R jump saying jump ahead by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, you know, however many bytes to this point if the R is satisfied. Oh, that's just an absolute jump, a relative jump. But this is this is this is code that goes directly bit for bit into the microprocessor. And that means that there's you might be like in this case there's interrupts happening, but you have to declare what those interrupts do anyway. So it's all up to the person programming it to decide how you're going to take care of multiple tasks for the CPU to, to do. And that's very empowering because it means that you control every aspect of what's going on and you can't blame anybody else for your mistakes. This is a board that my friend designed. This is the CPU right there. That chip is the same one that's on an Arduino. The difference is that this one is a surface mount package, unlike the one in the picture that I showed earlier, which is a, uh, this one. You see that's a diff package, dual inline pin. The nice thing about this one is that when you fry it, you can, you can unplug it from the socket and then stick a new one in. There's no soldering necessary. Also, you can use that chip by itself. You don't need this board to use this chip. You need to program it a little bit differently so it doesn't need the crystal above it, but you can just use this chip by itself connected to LEDs and the power source, pretty much nothing else. So this chip right here, uh, actually it's, the, it's this one. This chip is the, uh, the same chip that's on an Arduino. But instead of running the Arduino firmware that's kind of a bootloader for whatever program you want to put in that comes in over the serial, it was programmed directly with this pin header using the special hardware that we use to program Atmel products of this type, which is how you can get, you can control every bit that's on the chip instead of having to um, upload it and leave the bootloader on there. You didn't want to do any of that. This chip right here, this is actually exactly what you were asking about. This is a multiplexed output chip. So you can see that it's connected to the CPU by these three little wires. But the outputs are many. It has all of these different outputs. And there's probably more on these last pins here that aren't used. But the point of this chip is that the outputs not only are many and are controlled just through this little serial protocol through these chips, but these outputs are capable of controlling 200 volt loads because the neon tubes that make up the displays for this clock are 200 volts. Um, they, they use 200 volts to light up the segments. And uh, this circuit right here is the power supply for that 200 volt thing. It's uh, taking the low voltage that the clock is powered by and then stepping it up with this inductor and this transistor in order to get the 200 volts right here. And then these are resistors, and there's two of them on the way to each of the four digits. So the plus for each digit is connected there, 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 and there, each with their own pair of resistors back to the power source. And then the minus for each segment, that's, uh, this would be the, uh, probably one and two for the first digit in case you want to have 24 hour time. The, the Nixie, tube, uh, Nixie tubes are num numeric displays that are unlike the kind that we're accustomed to that have seven segments, they actually have a separate piece of metal for each number. So you can see the three is its own piece of metal, which means that instead of saying you want a seven, so you have to have the top, this one, and this one, it's just a separate wire for each number. And that means that on here, you've got the one and two for the first digit, 
and then 10 digits for the left one, 10 digits for the right one, and then these ones right here, those are for the LEDs that are in the middle in between the lights. You can see them right there. And I remember when he asked me, what should I do with the LEDs that are in between the things? And I, I came up with some dumb ideas, and he ended up making it so that they count the number of seconds in binary. Like that. So that's what that does. More questions? See, that's an at mega 48. The chip in an Arduino is typically an at mega 328. It has 32 kilobytes of flash, which is the disk where your program is stored. And uh, this one's an at mega 48 because when you write an assembler, you typically don't need very much memory to store your program. This chip right here is the time chip. No. This is a 32 kilohertz frequency standard. That's the heartbeat that runs the CPU. The CPU is running at 32 kilohertz. It's very slow. But that's how it keeps track of the time, is that the stand frequency standard is very accurate. This is that multiplexer chip that um, controls the uh, on and off of a whole bunch of outputs. And you can see it's connected to the CPU with, I guess, four wires, clock, data, and then latch enable and blank. And this uh, underline before the signal name, that's sometimes shown as an exclamation point, sometimes shown with a line over it. But what it means is that this pin is that meaning, but it's inverted. It means that if you want it to do that thing, instead of putting a logical high to that pin, you put a logical low. It's an active low signal. So for example, this blank pin, if you, obviously that tells this chip, regardless of the state of all your shift registers and everything, just make all of the lights off. And the way that it, the way that you do that is your, mic, your CPU makes this pin a logical low. Normally you think of logical one, you know, logical one or a true or something, meaning yes, do this thing, but for whatever reason this is wired logic low to blanket. And then um, LE, that's latch enable, that is the command to tell this thing, take all of the bits that I've sent you, the information for all of the states here, and make that your physical reality now. The clock and data are the pins where the CPU sends the bits for all of these different outputs in order. It says, okay, I'm going to want the first one to be a, a true, the second one true, the third one false, fourth one true, you know, all the way around there. But instead of it actually changing the lighting up of those lights as you're giving it the list, you just hand it the list through clock and data. And then when you're done, at the moment that you want that to be the new state of all the outputs, simultaneously, that's when you bring latch enable to a logical low, and then the chip instantly changes the outputs to the new state. And these are the digits that are represented. You see they have the 10 pins for the different numerals. And that means that if you wanted to have some sort of weird state of this clock, you could have multiple numbers lit up at the same time. That would be ridiculous. <laughs> And then this A, that stands for anode. And I was right, the first digit just has the one and the two hooked up. This is the chip that makes the, the high voltage, the 200 volts here for the, um, for the lights. And you see the capacitor has to be rated for 250 volts so you don't end up with more uh, voltage on the capacitor than it's rated for and blow it up. Here's this transistor. Now this chip right here, the 34063, this chip is specifically for the purpose of making a voltage on the output by turning a transistor on and off until the correct voltage is achieved. And so it controls the transistor like this one, and then it looks at the result of the voltage that it's creating through this line that's called feedback. And this chip is hardwired to look for 1.25 volts on this FB pin. And then this resistor arrangement here 
2.94 k ohms and 464 k ohms is, the, is a voltage divider chosen for 200 volts out, which means when there's 200 volts here, there's going to be 1.25 volts here. And if you want to do the math with me, we can do it together. 2.94 to 464. So, uh, 2.94 divided by parentheses. Oh, well, let me do that. Okay. 2.94 divided by parentheses. 2.94 plus 464 equals this times 200 volts, 1.25 volts. So when there's 200 volts here, there's 1.25 volts here. That means that this chip is going to turn this transistor on and off in order to achieve 200 volts here and see 1.25 volts here and be happy. This chip is in every cell phone charger that's meant to plug into a car cigarette lighter socket, or almost every single one of them. And so those are, I should have mentioned, those are something that you definitely want to pull out of the e-waste piles. Whenever you see those little cell phone car chargers, they are very handy. They're almost, they're, they're always going to be wired to take in 12 volts from the car or whatever voltage from the car, it doesn't matter, and put out 5 volts. And that's really handy, just unmodified, because everything runs on 5 volts. All of our little microcontrollers run on 5 volts. This is another popular part that it's not so popular anymore, but a 78L05 or a 7805 takes a voltage around, you know, anywhere from 7 to 15 volts or, or more, and it regulates it down to 5 volts. And you need that when you're making any kind of simple circuit with 5 volt logic. The thing is that the way that this circuit does it is it's just a, a transistor that um, burns up the extra energy. That means that if the input is 10 volts and the output is 5 volts, it's going to burn 5 volts at the same current as your load in order to give you 5 volts. So if your power supply is 10 volts and you're using 5, you're wasting as much power and heat as you are using. But for a lot of circuits where you're not using almost any power, like you're making a guitar pedal with a little chip inside that just makes little decisions, it makes sense to use a 7805 because the power you're wasting is insignificant and uh, it's a good way to do it. Any other questions? You use a Python to control our community. Use a what? Python to control our community. Instead of using the programming language that people use in our The question is, can you use Python to control an Arduino instead of the programming language people normally write sketches in? And the answer is no because Python is a pretty high-level language and it uses a really complex interpreter. So, you can't really run Python on an Arduino. There's no, um, as far as I know, there's no compiler from Python to Arduino code. Arduinos run C, and there's a C compiler for Arduino, but if you wanted to run Python on an Arduino, you'd have to port that code. You'd have to carry it over, but it's just uh, like translating from Spanish to Italian or something, you know, it's just it's not, not a big deal. Not that I could do that, but um, you can't run Python in our, on an Arduino. But what you can do is you can run Python on uh, Raspberry Pi and then have the Raspberry Pi talk through the two little serial lines to an Arduino or just a chip, you know, like what's on an Arduino. And have, and, and have the Arduino running a program that says, when the Pi tells me to turn pin 15 on, I turn pin 15 on. When the Pi asks me what's the voltage on analog pin 4, I tell it the numbers. And then the Python runs on the Pi, and it talks through the serial port to the Arduino to actually make things happen and do that. And that's a good combination because it gives you a real computer that you can run real software on while, um, while giving you the hardware ruggedness and replaceability of like Arduino style microcontroller to get things done.
Also, I should mention, you can, um, if you're doing that, where you use the serial to talk from your OpenOrt router or your Raspberry Pi or BeagleBone or something to a microcontroller like an Arduino chip, you can have a whole bunch of Arduino chips connected to the same serial line. So you could have a whole bunch of those subprocessors all controlled from the same main CPU running Linux and Python and Node and whatever else. And uh, there, it's, a, it's a little bit of circuitry like putting like diodes and resistors on the communication lines if you want those little chips to be able to send back communications. But it's not hard, and you can totally do it. Anything else, or are we done? Does anybody want to play with the giant robot? Or the CNC machine before it goes away? Or do we want to take apart hard drives? Okay, well, I'm done. If anybody else wants to come up here, just like Thank you. Thank you.